Uh, okay, uh, it's nice to see uh, six people here <laughs> in the main hall. <laughs> so um, someone told me you should never start a presentation with an apology, but I am going to do that. Uh, this session was not my idea. <laughs> I kind of got handed it um, from somebody else. So um, what we're going to talk about is trying to get the best from your uh, best from your system um, when it comes to data. So uh, I'm going to cover a few things. Why is it important to get the data right? Um, what different data, so data sources are we talking about? Who needs the data? So it's fine to sort of say we need to get it right, but but actually who needs it? Um, some examples of what can go wrong, um, which again is quite funny. Um, some steps to avoid things going wrong. Um, so what kind of fail safes, fail safes can you put in? Um, some of our experiences and what I've had to do and come across. And then finally, just how you guys can help. So what can you do as users of the system or as implementers um, to help? So before I get into this, how many people are implementers and how many are users? I know Chloe and I know, I don't know name. Lewis, that's it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, users. Implementers, anyone? Both. Both? Okay. Both. Both? Okay, cool. And I've met you before as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> okay, so implementer, I would say, put you into that category and yourself. Oh, okay. Fine. Okay. How you doing? <laughs> it's Robin. Okay, so um, why is it important? So this is Xander's. <laughs> so, like, as an implementer, you've probably uh, done this. Uh, a few times, if you've tried to put in a system, you've, you've kind of put it in, and then you're, and then your customer sitting in front of you, you're going, "What about X?" And you go, hmm. uh, "Yeah, good question." So, it's imp it is important. Um, the majority of systems that I've seen fail fail because the data, uh, the customer doesn't trust the data anymore, so they can't use it. They don't trust it. Uh, and that immediately means it's not fit for purpose. It doesn't matter how functionally amazing that system is. Um, without the data, it's, it's not of any use to anyone. Um, so it's important in terms of confidence, and that means the users or the volunteers of your system, they need to be confident in that data. The supporters, so who are the people that are going to see that data? Um, with obviously web-based systems now, you've got people logging in, filling in their memberships, using membership numbers for discounts, stuff like that. If those, if those bits of information do not work or don't do what they're supposed to do, then it's the supporter who also sees that. Um, trends, so if your data is not right, how can you measure trend? How do, how do you know what the current number of members is? How do you know how many support regular donors you've got? How do you know any of this stuff? Where is your uh, demographic? You, if the data is not right, you can't measure trends. You can't really do it. Reach and effectiveness. So again, um, if you don't have, if for some reason you didn't bring across postcodes and addresses properly, um, suddenly you don't know where, where anyone is and you can't reach the people you want to reach. Um, in the same way, if you've got the same person in your system 20 times and you send them an email 20 times, you're probably going to lose them pretty quickly. Um, insight and analysis is... Um, the kind of larger scale of stuff. And it's about um, being able to answer business questions, really, it comes down to. So management often want to know, well, how did X go? Or how did Y go? And um, has it been year on year? And where are we? And what's the projections? So these are normally insight questions or analysis questions. Um, so again, it's important. You can't answer these business questions if the data is not trustworthy. Um, another reason is to maximize the implementation. Uh, I can't tell you the number of CV installs that I come across that um, don't use the majority of the CV functions because nobody really knows 
what level level of data is in the system so they don't they're afraid to turn things on so nobody wants you to fill in a form because they're not sure that you've got the right information about that supporter in the first place to then send you the form to fill in so they end up sending out a blank form and then the supporter fills that in you end up with another supporter and you know the problem just escalates so uh, in order to kind of maximize your implementation it's critical to get the data right um, integration so again um, if your source data is a little bit wonky then when it comes to integrating to third-party systems you end up with more hassles you can't get the data in you can't get it out um, when you do sync it it's a mess anyway the wrong wrong pieces are against the wrong contacts etc um, and also with integration is data consistency so users these days have quite high expectancies of when they're looking at their data you should have it correct and if they've updated it once they're expecting their entire journey their entire relationship with you to be to be updated they're not expecting certain parts of the system to show their old address and certain parts to show no new address so again if the data in the first place is not right integration becomes a headache and you start ending up with these sort of problems uh, just welcoming all the civic co-op guys Are you all here <laughs> uh, so um, just to kind of go bare basics on this, what is data? So we often use the term get the data right and everybody thinks that's a contact record, that's easy. But actually it's a, it's a lot more than that. So with Civi and obviously you normally be uh, using an integrated CMS as well, you're actually talking about the CRM data. So that's the contact, any relationships they've got, how they fit in uh, in terms of organizational structure, where they belong. Um, their history, the giving history, their interaction history with you. All of that stuff is in the CRM. There is going to be some of that stuff in the CMS as well. So you, they've probably bought stuff from you in the past. Um, they may have ordered things online. They may have filled in a form. They might have done all sorts of things. Um, that's going to be in your CMS system probably. Um, you've got shop data. So again, we come across a, a number of installs where the shop is its own entity and people's purchase histories are their own record somewhere else. So again, it's bringing that information in. Um, third party giving sites, so again, UK specific really, but obviously we have quite a lot of uh, Just Giving, Virgin Money, third, third party fundraising sites where your fundraiser, your donor, your supporter is also existing in, in those systems. Uh, and then finally, you've got, kind of got banks as well. So, you know, um, Regular donors who are given by standing order, as an example, their data is in there somewhere too. Um, okay, uh, then you've got kind of derived or analytical data, so data that's built on other elements of data in your system. So, for instance, if somebody is giving a history, you'll derive that from from their financial history, um, and you'll kind of work out are they a regular giver, what's their average donation, when do they give. That's kind of derived information. Um, you've also got things that come from third party sites like geocoding, wealth mapping, stuff like that, that relies on the data that you've got. So if you've got someone's address wrong, then their wealth mapping record's gonna be wrong. Um, so th there are other bits of data that also need to be taken into account. And obviously these days you've got social media and other types of media. So what have people been blogging about us? What have they been tweeting? Have they got YouTube presences, stuff like that? So there's, there's all sorts of things that kind of come into this. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, obviously, it'll take a, a lifetime. Um, so we'll just try and keep it basics. <laughs> uh, so the first thing I often ask um, when, when we start implementations is like, what, whose data am I actually dealing with? Um, and it, it'd be amazed how many different answers you get to that question. So I've done membership installations where you say, whose data is it? And the, the person in the front office shop will say, it's my data it's not the membership team's data. And you're like, but how's it your data? <laughs> I don't understand, it's membership information. And it's about responsibilities and who uses it more than it is, uh, what does it actually mean? So it's an important question and it's often something that, that you have to kind of get straight in your head first. Who are you delivering to? Who, who's gonna use it? Um, so the supporters obviously need their data as well. So again, integrated CMS, people can these days log in. I'm not personally a fan of this whole login approach, but it's, it's, it exists and I think 
um, businesses often try to implement it. So obviously, if someone logs in and you're showing them somebody else's record, then it's not good. So, <laughs> or you're showing them data that you've got for, had about them 10 years ago, again, it's not good. Um, it can get a bit more than just not good. It can get problematic. So if you've got their gift aid information wrong, then that's a bigger problem. It's not just a, oh, sorry, uh, isn't really going to fix that. If you can't provide them with tax credits like Chloe and the guys were trying to do, then it's a problem because you, you have to be able to do that. You have to be able to say, this person's given 20 donations, here are their tax receipts. If you can't do that, it's a problem. Um, the Insight team obviously need their data. They need to be able to measure it. They need to be able to answer the business questions. They need to be able to see trends because they're going to try and change processes. If those processes aren't resulting in, in the changes they're expecting, then, um, <clears throat> then, then they can change. But if they can't get to it, they can't get what they want, then they can't do their jobs effectively. Uh, management. So these are the ones that I often find the hardest to actually tell me what they want. So they kind of say, yeah, we want management reports. And you're like, well, what does that mean? Well, you know, you know the usual. Uh, OK, fine. So yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, what, and then the next question is, but surely the system does that. So yeah, yeah of course it does that. So um, often I will tackle them last, um, as harsh as it sounds. Um, and they, normally you can tackle them in a way of, that says reports and dashlets, and you can kind of pacify them once they understand what CV actually is and what it does and what the data actually means, then they're in a position to accept it. Uh, and normally that means you've got to get the rest of the users confident before you can approach them. <laughs> so that's just my experience. <laughs> and then you've got the CEOs. And I, again, I deal with them kind of separately because... Um, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> But actually, um, CEOs are a kind of interesting bunch, um, and often they are only interested in one or two key elements. So, for instance, if it's uh, like Royal Television Society, then it's, okay, we've got the conference, who's coming? Okay, that's all I really care about. You're going to tell me the stats and numbers of membership, that's fine. But people coming to conference, I'm going to call them and say, thanks, Lord, whoever, thank you for coming. So. So they can often, you just need to find out what they really, what makes them tick. And once you kind of know that, then you know, you know what it is they want. Um, so examples of what can go wrong with data. So for the implementers in the room, you've probably been in this position a few times where everyone's shouting and nobody really knows why. Because so <laughs> the implementer saying, that data is the data you gave me. The client saying, but that data isn't look, the data that I had in my old system, and management are going, what's happening? Where is our data? Who, who kind of knows what's going on? So where things go wrong, mushing. So mushing is, I don't know where I got this term from. I think it's, I think it's a proper term. I'm not sure. But it's basically when you are going to take data from three or four systems and try and amalgamate it before you bring it into your destination. That is the number one reason that I've seen systems go wrong, because that process isn't checked. And the data ends up in Civi or wherever. Um, the same contacts in there 100 times. Uh, the same financial record is represented as a soft credit, hard credit, a PCP donation, 50 different places, and it's just a mess. Um, so that's one of the main, main reasons. Duplicates, I can't even, I just, I want to cry every time I see that word. But <laughs> But yeah, duplicates, again, is a big, uh, a big issue. Um, so examples of duplicates causing problems are, I'll use Cool Earth as an example. So lots of duplicates, as Chloe will say. Um, and once those duplicates start logging in and have a presence, that's when real problems start, because they're, they've got a presence in the CMS as one user, as one ID. They've also got a giving presence in your CRM as a different user. And then they've got a regular giving presence as a different user. And then they've got a shop purchase that they've bought as user number five. And suddenly they log in and they don't see everything and you don't actually know who they are anyway. So we've, we've, we've done some quite heavy deduping with these guys. But yeah, duplicates is, is, a, big, is a big thing and it's often overlooked. Um, and again, in my experience, you, you can't do that. I'll come on to recommendations and stuff. Um, the third problem that I normally see quite a lot is IDs not being in 
in records. So data is migrated over, but there's absolutely no way of identifying where it came from. So you kind of look at it and go, well, where did that record come from? And everybody goes, I don't really know. And you're like, well, OK, so we're on to a loser here. Um, and that, that's normally bad planning. That's just somebody who says, I just need to get my contributions into Civi or wherever, and doesn't really think about somebody, some, one day someone's going to ask me a question about this particular record, and I need to be able to tell them where it came from. They just don't think that far ahead. Um, um, errors in source data. So customers don't like to hear this. Um, <laughs> Rubbish in, rubbish out, but unfortunately it's a fact. So often you'll come across systems that where an extract's done and the extract itself is faulty. So let's forget the source system. It's something in the middle before you even got your hands on it has gone wrong. Um, so that is where I've got into this sort of position of yelling and not really knowing why you're yelling. Um, what else goes wrong? So acceptance, so this where it's where a customer expects you to just do stuff, or the user, should I say, just expects you to do things and um, never really takes, uh, never really accepts the data. So they kind of say, yeah, it's all there, everything looks fine. But there's no formal acceptance, and then when you dig a little bit deeper, the issues start coming out, and you end up in this drift scenario where you're never really done with it, it just carries on. <laughs> So again, it goes wrong. And if anybody wants to say anything, please do shout out. I'm happy to, to sit down and not say anything. Um, uh, supporters log in and cause problems. So they log in and they don't see their information and the first call is back to the client. Um, what's happened to my data? Something's gone wrong. Um, historic data is wrong. So what happens there is you can't show a supporter who's been supporting you for 20 years that you know about them. That's kind of horrific in fundraising terms, and it happens. So, so again, you know, these are these side effects of of not planning properly. And the final one is you can't explain the data. So, as an implementer, if you get into that position, then you should be shot. It's the only thing I can say. Because <laughs> getting into a position where you can't explain what you did is not really is not really acceptable. So, if you're converting information, you're mushing whatever you're doing you should always keep an audit history of what you did. Every step should be, should be transparent. So you know the customer knows or the user knows. Everybody knows what happened. Um, and often I see systems where that's not possible. Uh, and often what has happened is the relationship's broken down between the previous supplier. Data's already in the system and there is absolutely no way to tell what happened. You're kind of onto a loser there. Uh, so some of the steps that we take, so this isn't a one glove, glove fits all, but just some of the tips that I can sort of say what we come back to. So I always come up with the first question I ask on a data conversion is, right, what are we signing this off against? What's your metrics? You need to tell me now how many members do you have? You know, how, what's the, the breakdown of uh, demographics? Giving history, what was the income last year? So those stats I'll ask from day one, and often that can take a couple of months for the for the user to come back with, but it's better to do that early because if they can't answer those questions, then there's no way they're gonna be able to sign off on the data anyway because nobody knows what, what they're talking about. Um, and often I will tell them quite early that it's a two-way two process. And if they don't take part in it, then it's not, it's not gonna be a good outcome. Um, they have to get involved, they have to spend time with it, they have to cross-check. Um, they can't expect the implementer to do all of that. Um, repetition. So we use Agile in development all the time, but I've never really talk, heard anybody talk about it in data, which is a bit weird. So uh, data migrations, I tend to run seven or eight times at a minimum um, before, before we'll sign it off, finally. So it's important in terms of, for us, we're a development agency, we can do scripts and we can do all sorts of things to make that happen. Um, if you're not and you're, you're a small implementer and it's a small bit of data, just document the steps. Keep a copy of that database. There's lots of different things you can do to kind of protect yourself and make sure that you know what happened, what the different um, configurations have led to. Um, if you can use tools, then use them. Um, so if you, if you are SQL savvy, then it's a great way to get data in. 
especially with a bit of PHP, you can use all the APIs. So civi has got a lot of APIs you can get stuff in. There's a, quite a lot of Pentaho projects now. So if you've got Razor's Edge, things like that, there's a few Pentaho projects flying around that do the data conversions for them. So um, they're worth keeping an eye on. I think that's probably the way things will go going forward. Um, so the next tip is involving the right people. So I want to tell you a little story. So um, we recently had a, <laughs> a client who has had a change of staff, let's put it that way. And we are now dealing with the accountants as our primary CRM user. And it's not fun. <laughs> so uh, as an example, um, as an example, so they take, obviously they take donations and they have funds for different things like campaigns effectively. So the first question I got asked was, this, this campaign, this, this money has been refunded, so where's the debit record in the bank? And I was like, hmm? It's not an accounting system, it's a CRM system. But surely it does account, it's money, right? So not having the right people in the right places leads to those sort of conversations. If you're not, if you're not strong and you don't understand CIVI or CRMs, then what you'll try and do is make that happen in CIVI or in whichever system you're, you're using and you will fail. It won't work. <laughs> so that's one of the examples. I've had others where you're kind of talking to membership people who are really set in their ways and that's the way they work and they do not understand change, don't want to understand change. Um, so again, they're not the right people. It's getting the right people on side will really help you. Um, so it's quite an important step. Uh, so that's my examples of the wrong people. Um, errors in the source data. So again, uh, pretty much every single implementation I've ever done has errors in the source data. As much as people don't want to admit it, it's there. Um, and you need to identify it. So your job is to make sure that canceled orders don't end up as contributions in CIVI, as an example that um, a regular donation might be marked in a particular way, like thank you does it one way, Razor's Edge does it another way. Sometimes it's repeated, sometimes it's not. So you've got to understand what this data actually means, to it, how often was it given, stuff like that. Um, sometimes the export itself is just corrupt. So there's double quotes in the wrong places, single quotes in the wrong places, commas missing. And it's, it's a simple thing, but you end up with five records going missing and suddenly everyone's lost confidence because they can't find the five most important members on earth, right? So, um, so it's, again, it's important to just cross-check that data, look at the number of rows. When you're doing your migrations, make sure your numbers add up. Add up. Um, and what I tend to follow is I will just cross-reference against the source data. So the data I was given, I will check against. I won't go back to the source system. So I will say, okay, I've got 10,000 records in my spreadsheet. I have 10,000 records in CV. I can cross-check a few postcodes, a few IDs. I'm happy. It's, it's all fine. It's your responsibility to then check back to the core system, the system you were using. Um, it can be a difficult thing, but that's where the two-way two -way process comes into it. If the customer doesn't want to do that, they're not valuing their data. That's, it's a simple thing. So again, setting that out from the outset is, is important. Um, acceptance. No one wants to sign anything. It's amazing how people work um, because they're worried that they've signed it and someone one day is going to say it's wrong and then they're going to get blamed for it. But it's important to get some form of sign off. So sometimes I'll just send an email to say, right, okay, this is what's in CIVI. These are the numbers in CIVI. Do you agree? You get an email back saying, yeah, that, that all looks right to me. In effect, that's an acceptance. And should, should it get messy, you can come back to that. Um, another important step is to clean up the source data. Uh, I have seen probably five implementations where people have tried to do it during migration. Recipe for disaster. Doesn't work. Isn't going to work. You can never reconcile it and you're onto a loser. So always try and get it fixed, either in the source or you fix it in after, uh, after you've signed it off in, in the destination. I try not to do it that way. I try to always do it in the source, but sometimes the tools aren't there. You can't. Um, but doing it during migration is just a no-no. Um, I've mentioned this before, so just making sure that every element of data that you took has an ID against it that you can track it back to the source system and the source line. So if it's a contribution, 
it should have the ID of the source system against it. So you know exactly where it came from and you know exactly who it was against at the time. And there's no questions around it. Um, choosing the right approach for the sizes of data. Ooh. So Civi is great if it's 10,000 contacts, 20,000 contribution, you can do it. Take a couple of hours, but you'll get there. You try doing a million, no chance. <laughs> it's not going to work. So that approach is very important from the outset. So if you start off trying to do it using Civi's import tools and then spend a few days messing about with it to then only realize actually this isn't going to work, um, that's a waste of time and you're going you're to start to lose a bit of confidence in the customers because they'll be looking at you going, why is it taking you so long? So larger data sets I will tend to do through scripts. So SQL scripts, PHP, um, Pento if, if needs must. Um, but it's important to know that. So I'll come on a bit later on the Civi gotchas, but um, my numbers are normally 10,000 contacts, 10 to 12,000 contacts, fine, I'll do it through the Civi way. 20,000 contributions is about the max. I won't go any higher than that. Anything else, script. Um, and the important thing is you've got to be dynamic. So there is no single way to, to kind of deliver data and to make it work. Um, everybody's different. Some customers are quite dynamic and are happy to work with you. Others will take a real standoffish approach because they didn't want to change the system anyway. The users didn't want to change it. It was management that told them to do it, so they're doing it. So you kind of have to be a bit dynamic and try and, try and work to them. Um, availability of staff is my number one problem normally once we get going. Um, We've got one on the go now where I've had a, a quite heated discussion with a customer to say, we really need you to check this data. Uh, I don't have the time was the response. Oh, okay, uh, well then point me in the direction of someone who can. Oh no, no, I want everything to go through me. <coughs> okay, so like, how do we go forward then? Um, I'll check it tomorrow, okay, check it. So after having checked it, there was no check and it was a, I'm trying to send emails, it's not working. Did you check the data? No. So, well, okay. <laughs> so this kind of conversation happens amazingly quite a lot. Um, so, and that, to be honest, it's my mistake. I, with, this, with this client, it was all a bit tight. We didn't really have the time to sit down and go through a proper project, project plan. And this is the situation we've ended up in. So trying to get a uh, cu customer's buy-in, it is a few days work to check data, to make sure it all looks right, to work through it with you. Because you're not be able to guess all the answers. You, it's not going to work. Um, so you need that. And that kind of leads me on to the level of education needed. So there's a translation process from old to new. And that needs to be made clear to everybody, on, everybody involved that, yeah, OK, you used, to call it, you used to call it a donation or a gift if it's thank you. But now it's a contribution. Let's try and use that terminology, terminology and not just change it to gift which then causes problems in other areas of the system. Um, and if you can kind of do that early on, then, then, it, then, it, then it works. Um, the state of the project. So the reason I put that there is sometimes you inherit a project. It's not, it wasn't yours from the beginning. And you have to adjust the way you approach that. You, you can't approach it the way you would have if it was one of your own. Um, so again, you, have to be, you just have to be a bit dynamic on it. So Civi CRM specific gotchas. So the import tools can be slow. I don't know why I thought can. Obviously it's R. I think it's R. <laughs> yeah. um, so again, you, you know, the tips are use APIs or files or Pento, something else. Um, another gotcha is this thing about contributions and contacts being two separate imports. Uh, it's probably my biggest bugbear with the import process that you can't import some entities in one shot. So like if I've got participants and I want to import them, and if they don't exist, I want to create them as contacts, can't do it. Yeah. So you've got to do it in two stages. And that's where it becomes a bit of a pain in the backside. You have to make sure the IDs are right and things like that. Um, where to put the data? Uh, these conversations I've had about a million times. So should I use a tag or a group? So like, OK, so my, so my interpretation, tags are attributes of a person or a contact. So the fact that someone's got blue eyes is a tag. The groups is the segments that you're using for your organization. So you might have a group of blue-eyed people who live in London. 
So you'll use a combination of the tags and other attributes of the contact record to then form groups. Now, some of those groups might not fit into that. There might be VIPs and things like that. But generally, that's the approach that I take. And it seems to work okay. If you try and explain it any other way, you end up with lots of tags and lots of groups. And it all gets a bit messy because you don't really know which way to go on it anymore. Um, another gotcha, another one that people stumble on is should I create a relationship or a contact reference? When to pick? Yeah. So, depends. <laughs> There's, there's, no, there's no easy answer to that. There are two different options. So in CIVI terms, you can either relate contact A to B, or you can have a field on contact A which has contact B in it. And they're two different things. So a relationship will allow you to do a bit more in terms of inheriting permissions, in terms of structuring your data, and being able to run specific reports, whereas a contact reference won't quite give you that flexibility. There's a multiple relationships, it's singles and stuff like that. So they are two different things, so you do need to think about which one to use when. Reporting and life is a lot easier if you use contact reference, but it doesn't always fit. So it's just one of those things. Um, custom data types. So I always try and put any data that I don't know, I'll just throw it in some custom data and keep it against the contact. Because what you don't want to do is a year later, come back and try and put data that you didn't take on the first time around, try and put it into Civi. That's just, it's going to be a lot of issues because stuff's deduped, things have moved on. So anything that I don't know about, even if there's 20 extra fields at the end of the file, I will just stick them against custom data against that record. So in the future, if I need to do anything with it, it's easy. It's still there. I can work with it and I can, I can push it around. Um, another gotcha, which we had recently with Cooler, <laughs> is migrating from CMS A to CMS B. So it's possible and it all works and it's nice and easy. And the problem comes when everyone's been logging in. So there's this wonderful little table called UF Match in Civi. And if you don't clear it down, you end up with a headache, is, is the way I'll put it. But effectively, you end up with people logging in and getting other contact records. Um, which is because the old UF match table from the old CMS had the user IDs for that CMS, and then you migrate it, and then the user IDs have all changed. So it's something to keep bear, bear in mind. <laughs> you will see it. Um, uh, and the other one we had was deduping with CVCRM with multiple users. So there is a slight bug in Civi where the dedupe results are held in one pot. So even if you're in as five users, you'll see the same contact like five times because it doesn't differentiate between your user sessions. So it's a slight problem in Civi, but you do see it sometimes. When if, every, if you've got five people trying to clean up your data, then they'll get varied results and they'll see different things. So that's kind of everything in terms of how you can do implementations. Uh, what you, you could do to help the community and to help Civi in general is to feedback um, a few times. So like, if you've got problems and you can't do an import using the tools, well then tell someone, put it on the forums, create a wiki, do a blog post, do anything. Um, it's always better when there's a suggestion as well, not just a, I can't do X, full stop. Um, <coughs> because then someone's just gonna reply, say, well, okay, neither can I, <laughs> full stop. Um, so let's try and have some suggestions. Um, sharing what you've done and what works is really helpful because I guarantee you somebody out there is going to be trying to do exactly the same thing. And if you've done it and you've been through the pain and you know what to do, well then throw it up and somebody can use it. Uh, and equally as important, uh, tell us what doesn't work. Right? So if you've tried something and it didn't work, then let people know. Because somebody, again, will be out there trying to do exactly the same thing um, and you might make a friend. Right? <laughs> And you can all complain about CV together. Um, so they're, they're, they're just a few things. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's pretty much me done. I don't know if anybody's got any questions or specifics. No? Eric, you must have some horror story you can share with us. Horror stories? <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's Christian. Yeah. Newsletter that's doing backing, 
Mm-hmm. But then if we want to contact those specific people, can we use that by the tag? Because we've got we've also got those people in lots of different groups. Yeah. So I was just trying to find another way of not using groups and using tags as the right way to go. Right. So it th there's lots of different questions that we need to be asked before I can answer that. <laughs> so like, the, the, it depends on whether the data is inferred or not. So number one. So like, if somebody bought something from a shop. You don't want to manually be going into the system and going, oh, they've bought something from the shop. I'm going to tag them as a, as a, as a, as a shop purchaser or whatever. So those situations is where I would use a smart group because you're kind of saying, right, anybody that's done this kind of activity, um, I'm going to put them into a smart group and then that smart group will look after itself. Yeah. If it's um, an interest, then yeah, I normally use tags for that. So if somebody's interested in being a volunteer, yeah, that would be a tag. Um, but I would also expose that to them. So when they're filling in a form, they can tick that, right? So then that means that they're managing it, not you. Yeah, but you could, if someone did email you, you could, you could do it. And then the final bit is if you did want to communicate with all these people, you can then create a smart group um, that is a mailing list and then you can, from the text, yeah. Or from, it, for any, from any of the data in CV. So even if you did like, they've got this tag and they live in 20 miles of X postcode and they've got blue eyes, then, you know, that's my smart group. Yeah, and uh, just the final thing I'll say on it, you probably, whatever you do now is probably not what you'll end up doing because yeah, you'll, you'll then realise and go, actually, I want to change it. But as long as the data is all in CIVI, you can, you can deal with it. <laughs> it, w it will happen. You, you're not going to get it right from day one. But it, it's flexible. CIVI is flexible enough to, to let you adopt and let you change so you, without too much impact. So, so I wouldn't worry about it. Any other questions? <laughs> I think he's gunning for you to ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> no? Cool. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Cool.